Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, before we ask Janaki to present her paper, I'll just make a few announcements on behalf of uh, NMML. Uh, there, have been, there are 81 occasional papers which NMML has published under the new series History and Society, Perspectives in Development and Samaj or Itihas series. And these are available for a nominal fee of rupees 100. They're all, some of them are available on the website also. The recent publications include under the History and Society series, K. Satya Narayan's Politics of Caste and Identity in Contemporary South India, under the Perspectives in Deve India, Indian Development, Anuradha Kalhan's The Possibility of Stimulating Inclusive Growth, and under, under the Semaj Evam Itihas series, Narendra Shukla's Bhartiya Swatantrata Andolan or Pratibandit Sahitya Sayukt Prant Ke Vishesh Sandarb Me. I'll also just quickly let you know what are the upcoming seminars in the next four or five days. Tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m., <clears throat> there is a seminar of Dr. Madsen on scaling up or remaining rooted the Karnataka Farmers Movement in 1999. On 28th April, Monday, 3 p.m., Professor Daniel Klinksmith on environmentalisms in an era of global political crisis, 1914 to 1950. Uh, 29th April, Janaki Abraham, Dr. Janaki Abraham, come in and see my house, home loans, dream houses, and the fragilities of women's control over property in North Kerala. 30th April, public lecture by Professor Aisha Kidwai, reviewing partition, reclaiming lost ground, a critical recovery of Mridula Sarabhai, and the recovery of abducted women. On 1st May 2014, there is a workshop at 9 a.m., Nehru's India. Okay, after these announcements, I'm not going to stand between you people and Janaki Nair, who is known to most of you and is a friend and colleague of many here. Uh, for those who may not know her, Professor Janaki Nair is a professor at the Center for Historical Studies, School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She is as Mary says, author of many books, uh, including The Promise of the Metropolis, Bangalore's 20th Century, and Mysore Modern Rethinking the Region Under Princely State, Princely Rule. Uh, Janaki, can I request you now to please present your paper? And I believe there are some slides which seem to have evoked a lot of interest in the audience. Most of them are maps. Um, okay. Um, for those of you who haven't paid attention to it, the title of this talk is The City is History, New Indian Urbanisms and the Terrain of the Law. And the reason I'm reminding you of the title is because I realize uh, I uh, proposed this very audacious title uh, in all earnestness and with growing conviction that the city, that is to say the urban form that we all know so well is history. And I hope uh, I can take you along with me in this argument uh, as this lecture proceeds. But there's a different reason for me to feel particularly pleased today, and that is last year at exactly the same time we had the Thinking Through the Law Conference uh, uh, here in NMML. I'm very pleased that uh, Mahesh has invited me back despite that experience. Uh, a year later, and uh, particularly pleased that I'm sandwiched between two other talks, one which happened yesterday and one which is happening tomorrow, all of which are talking about Karnataka, which is a very rare in event indeed, because I really think that Karnataka is a bit of a black hole in most people's knowledge of this country. So I'm particularly pleased to be sandwiched here between these two talks. Um, what I'm going to try and do uh, here today is to insist on thinking historically as Marx uh, enjoins us to, while presenting my very uh, speculative comments on transformations in the urban form based on contemporary developments in Bangalore, which is, as you know, the capital of Karnataka. So let me divide my time into three parts. In the first, I will provide a schematic view of the history of Bangalore's urban form and its correspondence to certain stages of the city's socioeconomic development. In the second, I will pre present the controversies around and the legal and political challenges to 
the Bangalore-Mysore Infrastructure Corridor, which is to be constructed by the Nandi Infrastructure Corridor Enterprises, better known by its acronym NICE. Through a focus on the terrain of the law, so that's where the terrain of the law a part of my title comes from. And in final section, I will bring these two parts together to reflect on how we may come to terms with this emerging Indian urbanism to read these largely legal debates for the signs of a new historical stage, which may soon make the city both as an existing materiality and as an object of historical research a thing of the past. To begin with, the very naming, renaming of the 16th century town, it was founded incidentally in the early 16th century, the date that is usually given to the founding of Bangalore is 1537, from Bengaluru to Bangalore, and now today back to Bengaluru, signifies important political transformations within the city. Its transition from a founding, uh, okay, I'm going to skip that. Its transition from a founding moment in the 16th century to its reinscription by the British as the military cantonment of Bangalore and the return most recently as a consequence of linguistic politics to its Kannada name. But my concern in this presentation is with the logic of the form. Okay, so I will show you this slide. In Bangalore's history, from its origins as a mercantile town an anthropo in the peninsula, an emporium, along with Sri Patna and Mysore, for manufactures and raw materials for at least two centuries, it became a more recognizable center of production, particularly of textiles and armaments by the mid-18th century, the time of Tipu Sultan. So what I'm showing you is a map which, uh, of Bangalore, which was produced, needless to say, by the British, uh, uh, at the time of the capture of, of Bangalore, which happened before the fall of Tipu Sultan. And you can see here a very well-defined urban form. You can see here a city that is a bounded teardrop-shaped space, which was encircled by walls and a ditch, fortified on the southern edge. I am just going to use this. Is there a pointer? Or? Yeah, so in view, you can see it here. This is, the, this is the fortification. The fort is to the south of the city. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Is it on? Okay, yeah. So here, the fort is to the south of the city. This is the, uh, the space of the city itself. Very clearly and well defined. Divided, as you can see, uh, in a very legible sort of way, uh, into sections, uh, it is a, f uh, let me just read from this text actually because then I will otherwise take much more time. It's a teardrop shaped space which was encircled by walls in the ditch, fortified on the southern edge, replete with temples, mosques and dargahs. It was an urban form linked closely to tanks, market gardens and temples. Its legibility was underwritten by the designated spaces for castes and occupations. So all these names that you're seeing here correspond to particular kinds of caste-based occupations. Uh, but at the same time, I want to uh, suggest that it was, of course, a space which, which intermixed residential and occupational uses. After the fall of Tipu, the establishment of the cantonment in Bangalore revealed the first signs of a new, though inchoate, urban form. It was not only divided spatially between city and cantonment. So here you can see the original city of the 16th century city, as it were, shrunk to this left southwest corner, divided by a fairly large uh, parkland from what becomes the city, uh, the uh, civil and military station of Bangalore or what is popularly known as the cantonment. It was not only divided spatially between city and cantonment in a new east-west zonation that would continue until quite recently, but between a city drained of its productive capacity on the one hand and the imperatives of military uses on the other. While radically separating places of residence from work, it also encouraged a mix of farming, market gardening in the town itself. 
Industrialization under colonialism, to the extent that it happened at all, was stilted and did not necessarily drive urban form to the, in the same ways that it did elsewhere, not even in the herbs prima, that is to say, Bombay. Bangalore, moreover, did not go through the kind of smokestack industrialization that was characteristic of many other colonial cities. In the decades, so I'm going to move quite quickly here to show you another map of the city at the end of the 19th century. Clearly, there are some spaces which are being built up, including spaces in between the city, which is now here, and the cantonment, which is here, to the north, and so on. Uh, um, I'm also showing you the kind of urban development that was occurring, which is, of course, following this grid pattern, which is a very recognizable pattern of urban planning. Uh, this is done in response to the, uh, I mean, it was planned earlier, but it was done in response to the plague epidemic uh, in the late 19th century. And uh, you have a much clearer idea of how the city was divided uh, in this map of 1925, where the original city is again very recognizable in form, but is only a part of a, of a much larger urban space, which includes the plotted uh, grid kind of development that I just showed you in close-up, as well as the Cantonment Bazaar, again, separated by this vast swath of, of parkland. And if you wanted one more picture of 1935, that's uh, what you have up there. So, uh, uh, let me move quickly then to uh, the decades after 1947, which are actually quite important to us, when Bangalore witnessed another transformation when there was vigorous planning for what I call patriotic production. Uh, uh, the optimistic design and implementation of the most ambitious city form, that is to say the industrial township, with its dreams of producing a patriotic citizen. So I'm showing you here one sample of the, uh, the Indian telephone industry's township <clears throat> called Durwani Nagar which as you can see is perfectly planned and it's of importance to us. We'll come back to this whole question of township and what it will come to mean a little later. Yet even these developments remained enclaved, though transforming the areas around the units as more villages were urbanized. Post, and here I want to say that um, while we tell the history of, of Bangalore and we certainly uh, signal that in the pre-independence period, there was hardly any industrialization. The post-independence uh, post period is, of course, marked by very large-scale public sector industrialization, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, in the 40s and the 50s and in the 60s. But in the 70s, you have a development which doesn't make its mark on the urban form, but I want to signal it as, as a change in the economic profile of the city because it is often ignored in contemporary stories of how successful the IT industry has been. And that is the push into cities like Bangalore of rural capital, Kulak capital if you like, into the education industry. So there's a boom in the education industry in the 1970s and in the 80s. Karnataka is, as you know, one of the, one of the states which pioneered the so-called capitation fee colleges and uh, um, as I say, that is one step in our uh, economic history which is often missed out. <coughs> Post-80s, <coughs> as the city burgeoned and as its traditional urban core and its civil station were fast, fast eroding, Bangalore entered a new phase of urbanism where given the long acknowledged failures of planning, <coughs> There was the development of gated residential enclaves. Now, this is not particular to Bangalore, as you all know. What I have, and all, I, all that I'm telling you, incidentally, is stuff that I have already discussed in my book. I'm just giving you a thumbnail sketch here. <coughs> what I'm suggesting here is that planning, which by the 1980s was recognized as something that had by and large failed, was itself what was being offered as, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as a commodity to those who inhabited these gated enclaves. 
So planning itself was what was on offer to those who actually inhabited these enclaves. So planning, which in its originary sense was meant as a check on unbridled speculation, was meant as a check on unbridled competition for urban space, was itself turned into a commodity on offer in these uh, enclaves of, uh, uh, of, uh, which, which are increasingly happening from about the 80s. Um, it's, so what is offered is a controlled environment, a result of withdrawal from the uncertainties and the intolerable strains of city life. The emerging tech parks, and here's a satellite image, which also still tells you uh, a little bit the, uh, the, the, the form that is somehow now absorbed into the, into the fabric of the city, but still retains its shape because of the roads that are going around it. <coughs> no sign, as you can see, of the um, fort. Um, what was on offer here, I'm sorry, <coughs> the emerging tech parks meanwhile redefined work, play and leisure in new and exclusive ways, withdrawing from the chaos and unpredictability of the city into building up a hothouse effect. So I'm showing you what is first uh, characterized as a corridor within the city, the IT corridor which runs from Bangalore east to southeast. Uh, which, as I say, uh, marked out clearly or designated spaces for work, leisure, business, and play. play. <coughs> <coughs> One could say that we've now reached a new stage of urbanism, which is distinguished from all its previous forms, where planning is driven by a concern which is subordinate to no other driving material force than itself, a form of explosion implosion evident in what is called corridor, or what I choose to call corridor urbanism. And the best example or illustration of this emerging form of urbanism is the curious case of the nice corridor to which I am now uh, 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 turning. But before I enter that discussion, I just want to lay out uh, this triangulated field which constitutes the, uh, uh, and, and produces, as it were, urban space. And I'm thinking now of three elements, that is to say planning, law, and politics as that which affects the production, the consumption, the exchange, and of course the circulation of urban space. Planning, despite its very well-intentioned public face, is used to delay and defer, I'm sorry, uh, is by definition something that belongs to the realm of technocrats. So it excludes all but the technocrats, uh, it, despite, as I say, its attempt to uh, interface with the public. The field of the law, as we all know, is used to delay and defer, but rarely, less rarely, to overturn processes that are well underway. In addition to being unaffordable to many among the poor and the marginalized. So it seems at, one, at, the, at, the, at the surface that it is politics which appears to be the only manipulable resource in shaping uh, the space of the urban and in which, uh, to which particularly the poor and the marginalized may turn. But having said that, in this paper I'm actually going to look at the way in which the law is used as strategy, not only by those who hope for a miraculous intervention of the court to write, uh, to correct administrative or even political wrongs, but I read these current uh, or recent court judgments relating in particular to land acquisition for infrastructure projects, not to speak about the prospects of justice, but to decipher what they might tell us about this new urban form. And so I'm, I'm, I'm using the archive of the law, I'm using the archive of these court judgments in order to uncover what th they might tell us about the kind of urban form that the judiciary seems to be uh, almost obliged to bring into being. So, I, and I hope I can make this case uh, uh, um, persuasively. <clears throat> um, so we're seeing, I'm sorry, I have a bad throat today and I do apologize for my frequent interruptions. 
Okay, so I'll turn to my, I'll turn uh, quickly to my uh, second part and uh, please tell me how I'm doing for time because I might take longer than I'm, I intend to. The proliferating discontents around the construction of a Bangalore Mysore infrastructure corridor, BMIC, have unduly prolonged the completion of a prestigious project which had its roots in a memorandum of understanding signed in 1995 between the governments of Karnataka and the governor, state of Massachusetts. Planned in part as a four lane um, extendable to six privately built and operated toll expressway of 111 kilometers between the two preeminent cities of Bangalore and Mysore. <clears throat> the corridor development includes five self-sustaining independent townships, a peripheral road of 41 kilometers to ba around Bangalore, a 9.5 link road and an elevated link to the heart of the capital city as well. The high volume of contests over this project over the past 19 years, whether in courtroom or legislature, whether on streets or among NGOs, has ensured that no more than a paltry 41 kilometers around Bangalore City has been built so far. A recent news report claims that NICE has won its 566th court case when the Supreme Court rejected the need for a Lokayukta probe into the project. So you can, you can get a sense of the scale of the activity that is happening in the courts around this one project. <clears throat> I'm just showing you one more uh, uh, map which, uh, which sets Bangalore within this amorphous uh, metropolitan region which covers a, a space of something like 1,250 square kilometers. It's very, very large. Um, and here you have the, uh, f the first road, the only road actually that has so far been built, which is partially connecting the north of Bangalore to the south. Um, here's the, the intended first, uh, the, the, the BMIC corridor. And as you can see, the person who has put this map together helpfully tells you that it may not see the light of day. So, uh, <clears throat> but this is the plan. Huh? Um, of what new economic and political order is this project and the opposition to it a sign? More appropriately, as the conception and execution of this project is yoked to the fate of two cities, we may ask, does this infrastructure construction represent a textbook example of the switching of capital from primary circuits of pro production to the secondary in order to resolve through enhancing the built environment for production, the crisis of overaccumulation. I'm summarizing now the work of people like uh, David Harvey on these, uh, not just David Harvey, but also Lefebvre. <clears throat> or if we are not to take space as an inert commodity, but as a set of relations which are produced in specific economic and political circumstances, are we witnessing a new phase in the development of subcontinental capitalism and the emergence of a new urbanism as a sign of this phase? I'm not promising to answer these questions. I'm just setting them out for you because I would like to set up what I'm going to discuss. Now, in his discussion of economic transformation in contemporary India and the realm of democracy, Partho Chatterjee has outlined some features of what he identified as the new phase in which corporate capital has established its moral political hegemony over, among others, the apparatuses of the formerly relatively autonomous state, such as the bureaucracy and the judiciary. Yet this is not identical with the transitions to, bu bu to bu bourgeois democracy that might have been experienced elsewhere because of what he describes as political society whose activities belong to another domain. That which is more temporary, contextual, and unstable arrived at through <clears throat> direct political negotiations. To this, he also ties following Kalyan Sanyal's seminal critique of the transition narrative, the economic spheres of corporate and non-corporate capital and civil and political society, respectively. The new role of the state has been to ameliorate the process of capital accumulation and the ruptured unity of labor with the means of labor through the production and sustenance of what they have called a need economy, which aids the process of capital accumulation. Is the field of forces in contemporary Karnataka an affirmation of this elegant and insightful formulation? There is no doubt that the BMIC has seized hold of the planning bureaucratic as well as we shall see the judicial imagination in ways that signal a consensus about the imperatives of growth 
And we all have been hearing this for the last six months from somebody who is promising us growth. <clears throat> Here standing for rapid capitalist growth, uncontaminated by any earlier post-colonial notions of developmentalist growth. Michael Goldman has argued, with reference to several new projects coming up around Bangalore, the BMIC included, that we are entering a new phase of world city brokering, of speculative urbanism, this is the term that he has coined, uh, in which governments too have been obliged to play a major role. <clears throat> what is striking in the judgments that I have look at, looked at is the banal and minimalist claims of the company which has undertaken this project, NICE, under the leadership of the serial entrepreneur, that is the name he has been given, Ashok Kheni. It's a new word for Robert Barrett, serial entrepreneur. Uh, uh, and, and he has been able to win over the courts, the legislators, the media itself, to become the unquestionable common sense of this period. So let me go to uh, the earliest court judgment. I'm going to quote from a few judgments in order to make this very emphatic point about the unanimity of the law on this question. So, so bear with me here. <clears throat> in the earliest judgment which considered the public interest petition filed by H.T. Somshekar Reddy in 1997, the High Court of Karnataka took for granted the necessity of capitalist growth. And I quote, Government was satisfied that the interests of the state of Karnataka would be best served if the infrastructure corridor is industrially and commercially developed as contemplated by the Infrastructure Corridor Project Technical Report, as such development would promote industrial, commercial, and economic growth in Karnataka generally, and Bangalore in particular. It will create new job opportunities to the residents in and around the infrastructure corridor, promote tourism, decong decongest traffic in Bangalore and Mysore, ensure smooth and safer traffic between Bangalore and Mysore, and provide a world-class expressway between them. <clears throat> now, in the semantic shift from the conception of the Bangalore-Mysore expressway to an infrastructure corridor, the project's scope has been broadened and heightened in very material ways where opportunities emerge for framing, for framing both the claim to its overall importance and opposition to it. The BMIC has been imagined as the connector not merely between two cities, but to a global order, as relieving the pressure of the exploding cities of Bangalore and Mysore. This unquestioned common sense has been repeated ad nauseum in judgment after judgment, both in the High Court and the Supreme Court, as the inaugural point of judicial reasoning. So there is no questioning the very basis of this claim that it is in public interest and that it is <clears throat> going to lead to massive growth and, and, and infrastructural development. Uh, and it is precisely the will to cast this immense speculative enterprise as in the public interest that has provided the opposition with some of its most potent weapons. Yet the trajectory of events over the last 19 years and the shifts and changes that have occurred in this dense field of forces regarding the fate of the BMIC disturb the schematic oppositions that have been offered by Partho Chatterjee. While consensus may even, <clears throat> excuse me, while consensus may indeed have emerged around the logic of the form, that is to say, the necessity of producing specific built environments for world production consumption, of which the infrastructure corridor is a good example, the dialectics of content, which in turn may affect, alter, or even stall the logic of the form, which is why you have this map titled, May Not See the Light of Day with all its contradictions and challenges, which must also be taken into account. To begin with, how has this minimalist dream been accepted as a whole and deemed adequate enough for the courts to consistently uphold the rights <coughs> of the company, often in opposition to the state government's cautions? The large quantum of land that it has demanded is itself historically unprecedented in post-independence India, 20,193 acres spread over 141 full villages, 52 part villages in four districts, of which 6,956 acres is government land and the rest private, so about 13,000 and odd is private. In contrast to the near unanimity of the judici judiciary, <coughs> excuse me, why has the state shifted and changed its position from willing accomplice to chief opponent? 
before being forced back into performing its role as accomplice once more. What accounts for the fickleness of the legislature as opposed to the steadfastness of the judiciary? And are those whose lands and lives are being indisputably ravaged mere mute participants or recipients of this injustice of expro expropriation, this accumulation by dispossession? <coughs> This paper pays central attention to the terrain of the law and its ideological role in the imagination and production of BMIC. Considered here as both a structure and as a process, I would like to trace the ways in which the judiciary today conceives of itself as bringing clarity to production consumption relations while largely shedding its earlier mantle of dispensing justice, though it has been one of the key sites which have been approached by all parties in the contest. And I want to, uh, 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 again, refer to my book because I have uh, actually demonstrated the very, very powerful role played by the judiciary in correcting some of the administrative, political, and legal wrongs in terms of allocation of urban space in the uh, years after independence. Most importantly, I would like to trace the ways in which judicial discourse has redefined key concepts in post-independence quests for justice, namely the realms of public purpose and public interest. This will allow for speculation on the possible new urban form that the courts in particular now feel obliged to bring into being. So I'll just very quickly uh, summarize here that in a number of decisions uh, oh, of the 1950s and 60s, um, Land acquisition for productive purposes, uh, such as constructing the public sector units, etc., in Bangalore, were usually upheld by the courts as representing public purpose, insofar as, as it reflected not just regional but national industrial concerns. I have only 20 minutes, not half an hour. 25. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll try and make this briefer. I have uh, um, um, uh, cited in my book a number of court decisions which clearly reveal the willingness of the judiciary to play a role which is more equitable in terms of at least providing better compensation, if not actually reverting some of the decisions which were made by uh, the uh, state government. The notable cases that the court actually uh, uh, took a very strong stand in determining the, what it called the colorable exercise of power was when the Ramakrishna Hegde was the chief minister and he was himself playing the role of estate agent as in the non-resident uh, housing association case or in the uh, Revajitu case. These are two cases which I have already looked at. So I'll not go into the details of that discussion. I'm merely, merely using that in order to mark the distance that the judiciary has traveled away from that position where it was willing to act as a corrective on certain kinds of unjust appropriations that were happening in the name of public purpose uh, to a situation where such judicial frankness has become quite rare in this torrent of cases which surround the BMIC. After that initial judgment of which I read you a paragraph, the Somshekar Reddy judgment of 1997, practically every court has merely repeated the common sense of that judgment in order to emphasize that <clears throat> this, this is, a, this is a, a project which deserves to be established despite the very patent illegalities in which the company has uh, uh, clearly engaged. Um, experience, so I would like to show, uh, uh, I, I, I would like to uh, quote uh, one uh, further uh, paragraph from the High Court judgment which says experience has shown that all sorts of activities, industrial, commercial, cultural and other such and similar activities tend to concentrate in one city which ultimately ends up choking the system, resulting in shortages of essential elements required for good living like clean environment, water, electricity, clean air, roads, efficient transport system, open space, host of similar other things, reducing the city to a big slum. Experiment of developing self-sufficient small cities like sufficient water, uh, sorry, with sufficient water, electricity, good environment, along with the toll road as a corridor project, catering to the needs of the people living there as supporting cities to the big cities shall be a boon. 
helping the people living in big cities to lead a much better life. It would relieve congestion in the big cities. People living in the newly developed small towns in the corridor project would be getting the benefits of big city life without its disadvantages. Construction of an expressway between Bangalore and Mysore is a public purpose. So there's no questioning the nature of the public purpose that this project appears to serve. We may rightly begin by asking whether this judgment signals a move towards saving existing cities such as Bangalore and Mysore, or whether it is envisaging an alternative to them, a question to which we shall return again. That this conclusion, and I want to emphasize this, that this conclusion of the judiciary flies in the face of clear evidence of the historical failure of satellite towns and of other such similar plans to act as counter magnets to the metropolis bears restatement. Instead, while refusing to usurp the, ter the powers of the executive and question its decisions, the court further clarified, and I'm quoting again, if the public policy is for public good and welfare and in public interest, then the courts would not interfere in such matters. The court has to ascertain whether the policy of the government was a means to fritter away the public property for personal gains. If this element is missing, then the court would not interfere in the matter of public policy. So what you have actually, if I can cut a long story short, is a situation where the court is actually now pressing the state government to fulfill its obligations to the company to the extent of actually even fining the chief secretary for contempt of court. He was fined something like five lakhs because <clears throat> it was believed by the court that he was acting in contempt. So you have a situation where the judiciary feels obliged to uphold the initial framework agreement which was made between NICE and the government of Karnataka over and over again in the cases that it has considered uh, in this time. There was one brief moment when this unanimity of the judiciary opened up slightly, and that was in 2004, when there was one uh, single judge in the High Court of Karnataka who said there is something wrong here and we have to demand that the company return any of its acquisitions which do not pertain directly to the road construction itself. And it did that on the ground, it did it on a very, very technical ground. It did it on the ground that the people whose land had been acquired had not been told enough about the purposes for the acquisition of that land and therefore could not contest it. So it was a very technical point, but he said 40% of the land that had been uh, uh, acquisitioned in the first phase had to be returned to their original owners. This, needless to say, created a huge furor and there was an appeal filed and the, the, the division bench finally uh, overturned the single judge uh, uh, judgment. Um, then there was an interesting moment uh, uh, which is when the legislators or some legislators along with some public interested individuals filed a case against the company on the, on the grounds of the innumerable illegalities in which the company had engaged. And the court here took a very interesting stand, and I'm going to just read this one because we're really running out of time here, but I think it's an important argument that the court is making, and it, it bears uh, uh, listening to. Uh, this is what the court said. The petitioners who are only projecting the cause of the state government to cannot be allowed to agitate the issue that any excess land was provided for the implementation of the project. They, as representatives of the people or ordinary citizens of the state, could at the most be interested in the implementation of the project, but whether any excess land has been taken for the project or not could not be their concern. The court cannot allow its process to be abused by politicians and others to delay the implementation of a public project which is in larger public interest, nor can the court allow anyone to gain a political objective. These legislators, and this is interesting, it says legislators have not been successful in achieving their objective on the floor of the assembly, so now they have chosen to come to the court. <clears throat> and it went further in saying that, you know, uh, there is an oblique motive in the filing of the case before the court. 
It is alleged that despite the fact that the land around Bangalore, which had been acquired for the project and vests in the state government, had been, has been allowed to be sold by the original landowners, and I would like you to pay attention to this part, that the legislators are actually going against the interests of individual landowners who have already acquiesced to the sale of their land to the NICE project. So clearly, the legislators are not playing any kind of role in public interest, uh, but rather they are in favor of some influential persons and uh, so on. So I'm giving you a sense here of the steps by which the judiciary is redefining what cons constitutes legitimate public interest in questioning public purpose. The division bench therefore set aside the single judge finding on the grounds that the government has the power to build townships and not just infrastructure. Okay, so I'm, I'm as I said, I'm giving you very um, um, short uh, summary of that section. But the question that automatically arises, I'm sure, in all our minds is, what accounts for this extremely quixotic role of the legislature? In contrast to the near unanimity of the courts is the apparent fickleness of government, which gave with an open hand in the 1990s, backtracked in the 2000s, called for a review of the project, which had been dubbed, at least initially, the, quote, biggest scam in world history. And the person who said this was none other than Yediyurapa. Uh, the media and the judiciary have inter interpreted these vacillations as the unconcealed ambitions of the party in power at different points of time. In fact, as the Madhuswami petition, which I just read from, uh, noted, there were several alarming signs that the NICE had not been adhering to the terms of the framework uh, uh, agreement in fulfilling its side of the bargain, and indeed, it may never be able to do so. There was a growing unease about the capacity of NICE to fulfill its part of the agreement, since even 10 years after the genesis of the project and the free transfer of government land to the company, quote, the state and all its citizens between Bangalore and Mysore are yet to see even a single yard of the so-called expressway road. Raising the alarm, so what these legislators are actually pointing to in their petition is that it's not only that the framework agreement to which all the courts appear to be adhering uh, is flawed, but that in the course of the acquisition procedure and in the course of the uh, building of this project and so on and so forth, things are unfolding which are clearly violating the law. So it's not a, something which is fixed in the framework agreement itself. So it's an interesting kind of gap between the initial phase of the project and what is actually unfolding, the illegalities that are unfolding, to which these legislators are actually uh, pointing. I'll very quickly read the kinds of things that they pointed to. They said that acquisition was being paid for by mortgaging government lands with banks. So they, they, the, the uh, uh, government land was taken, mortgaged with the bank, the money that was raised was used to buy the private uh, lands. The consortium had disappeared, leaving only one family firm of Keynes, that is NICE. The uh, uh, most interesting thing that happened in the course of these, uh, in this period, was the establishment of a new planning authority called the, um, uh, the Bangalore Mysore Infrastructure Corridor Planning Authority, which superseded the planning authorities of both Mysore and Bangalore and all the places in between as well. Um, identification of the land was by NICE while acquisition was undertaken by the state government. So, you know, all kinds of things which are clearly uh, uh, violating uh, any kind of known forms of acquisition. NICE was given a generous 10 years to buy government land. High-ranking officials were enthusiastically answering the illicit demands for, of the company. Uh, uh, and as I said, a new planning authority was instituted. Compared to all these, this seems like a relatively smaller crime. The NICE was using bitumen rather than cement concrete for its road. Uh, it had promised to do a bitumen road, but it actually ended up doing a cement concrete road, even in that 41 kilometers that it built. Um, and in the areas around Bangalore, where the peripheral road had already been constructed, land was already changing hands and passing to private builders. So forget about these wonderful townships that the NICE was promising us. The land was actually being transacted by private uh, construction companies. 
it seems almost as if NICE was practicing some form of Japanese Kanban in its project. That is to say, adapting just-in-time kind of methods to road construction, you know, taking advantage of the piecemeal nature of acquisition to arrange loans and to sell its property to begin the next round of acquisitions. Uh, the market was openly and directly driving planning in a form of market-led boosterism in collusion with the state. Um, but uh, nevertheless, what is, what is also interesting here is, and I'm returning now to the language of the law, is the collective delirium to which it seems like some strands of government, the bureaucracy and the judi judiciary alike, were, uh, 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 were uh, you know, in thrall, as it were. Uh, because in 90, as early as 1997, the court was saying every minute detail was explained, including the scientific method adopted by the respondent for identification of land for the project. Now, I want to emphasize here that the so-called scientific method that was used by NICE was not surveying, which is the normal standard way of establishing which kinds of lands can be taken over for acquisition. It was through certain kinds of uh, uh, topographical surveys which were done by, uh, uh, you know, using satellite imagery. And the, uh, and the argument that was given by the company was that doing actual surveys, that is to say ground level surveys, would, need to need, would lead to needless speculation and that's what they wanted to avoid. It was a striking instance of what Henry Lefebvre has described as the generalized terrorism of the quantifiable, which accentuates the efficiency of repressive space, amplifies it without fear and without reproach, all the more so because of its self-justifying nature, its apparent scientificity. The courts remained impervious to ways in which this very scientificity, which dazzled the court in Somshekar Reddy case, steadily evaporated over time. Nice incidentally took refuge behind a typographical error to claim more than 1,600 acres considered adequate for its road project. And it refused to respond to the demand for data to the KC Ready Committee, which was inquiring into acquisition of excess land. So much for the so-called scientificity of its uh, data collection. But uh, nevertheless, this is something which was also, as I say, uh, pointed out by the judiciary and, and uh, was uh, one of the flaws to which the legislators seem to, pay, to point in their uh, extremely uh, uh, huge case. Now, what was at stake in this period between 97 and 2004 was not merely the patent or obvious changes in governments and their short-term goals, leading to certain reversals of earlier stands, but the latent capacity of the state to create and control liquid resources such as real estate. A powerful mechanism of globalization, as Kevin Gotham points out, is the work done by the state in delocalizing land and converting it into a liquid financial asset. Real estate financing may be globalized, but production remains localized. And particularly in the context of countries like India, the task of delocalizing land, of disembedding it from certain kinds of social activities, in this case, of course, primarily agriculture, occurs alongside its embedding in new social activities. The state is therefore an active participant in fueling this process of speculative urbanism, as Goldman suggests, but it also needs to rein in overly speculative activities, especially given the contradictory pressures of representative democracy. So uh, what we are seeing here, therefore, is a, uh, the possibility of developing a conceptual framework which accounts for not only the necessity of the state taking a role in disembedding or as it's called in delocalizing uh, land uh, in, and making it a much more liquid resource, but also taking the political costs of the process of disembedding land into account. The protests, protests therefore of the last 19 years have, along with the court, redefined the meaning and depth of the public in whose name both the growth activities and the opposition to it are being initiated. 
Taking forward the idea that the public interest is best served by such projects, however, nice lawyers cited case law which proved the urgency and national necessity of building loads, roads. In a breathtaking slate of hand, two cases were cited. First, the direction given to build roads where there are no roads for enrichment of the quality of life. This is in inaccessible hill areas. And second, the direction by the court to Ratla municipality to undertake the building of drains to stop effluents from polluting. So there's all kinds of, of, of other cases which are being cited by NICE in order to make their argument for public purpose. Okay, so let me come to the last part. Can you give me 10 minutes? Five. We just have to cut down on discussion time. That's the only but now I'm coming to the part that ties sure. up these two. Sure. Which is, does, to, which is what, what, do, what does this imply? So here you have the local area, uh, local planning area map of uh, the Bangalore-Mysore uh, Infrastructure Corridor Planning Authority, which I uh, mentioned to you was, was uh, established in this period. Here are the planned townships, and I want to hold that for a, a moment uh, just to show you, just to uh, help us in this part of the discussion. Uh, and I want to start with uh, what this corridor um, uh, uh, urbanism may be uh, signifying in the contemporary context. Now, in his book, Urban Revolution, Henry Lefebvre has pointed out that the tools that one used to study the industrial city were not adequate to, and indeed led to certain blindnesses to, the presence of what he called urban society, that expanded scale of urbanism which was threatening to dissolve the distinctions between rural and urban, between cores and peripheries. As we know from the work of uh, Gideon Sjöberg, 55 centuries of city, city life were irrevocably altered with the onset of industrialization. Now, Lefebvre was suggesting a conceptual inversion in making a very sharp distinction between the modern city as an industrial effect and urbanism, which is much more generalized, itself the motor of accumulation. Now, our colonial past does not, did not engender the industrial city in its classic form. Uh, and we have many historians who have pointed to this. Uh, uh, Rhodes Murphy is one such. Uh, um, Anthony King is another. Um, um, Atiyah Habib has talked about uh, uh, um, uh, dependent, uh, sorry, Anthony King has termed it the kind of urbanization that happens under colonialism as a form of dependent urbanization reflecting purely military, administrative, and political functions. Atiya Habib, in contrast to the, pro, uh, to the preponderance of uh, 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 secondary occupations in industrial countries of the 19th century, says there was only spurious tertiarization in colonial India, namely the proliferation of services linked neither, neither linked nor conducive to economic development. And a particularly exam, uh, illuminating example of this is, of course, the very wonderful description we have of the Kacheri towns of Bengal by MS Islam. So is Lefebvre at all useful to us in thinking through the specificities of the Indian modern city? I want to start by saying uh, in this last bit that rib ribbon development, that is mushrooming growth along all state and national highways, which in plan after plan from the 1960s was lamented as the sure sign of planning gone wrong, has in this project been elevated to a principle of planning itself. If the state, so there were two state highways. There was State Highway 17 and the State Highway 89, and both of them were considered no longer adequate to deal with the higher levels of traffic between Bangalore and, and Mysore. And one of the reasons that this group, which took up this project, stated where, where the problems with the existing highways was precisely ribbon development. But nevertheless, what they are proposing, as you can see, they had initially proposed seven townships. Now they are proposing only five. Uh, is the idea of distributing urbanism along the highway, which is far from being an utopian concept. Uh, concept. It's, 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 it's uh, in some ways thickening this idea of building along this highway, making it into a principle for profit. Um, the BMIC, therefore, amply aided by government and judiciary, anticipates and capitalizes on the tendency for ribbon development in its alignments and plans, turning these new nodes into dedicated dormitory towns for the two big cities. But it also signals a new stage in the life and death of cities in India, a unique and new annihilation of space by time. 
What one sees embodied in the idea of the township here has been anticipated to a certain extent in the gated communities where there is a movement away from inhabiting to habitat, to the extent that inhabiting means relationships with groups of objects, classes of acts and people, producing certain relationships rather than receiving them uh, or passively perceiving them. Habitat refers to box or function where there is uh, so, so in opposition to the fullness of inhabiting. What is lost in these urban habitats is what Richard Sennett has referred to broadly as the end of narrative time, the depth of historical time, as we say. These nice townships aim to erase the difference between rural and urban and to bring into being opportunities of the city with the abundance of the rural, fresh air, quiet and smaller face-to-face -face communities. The five townships are respectively, and you can see them on this map, an ecotourism center closest to Mysore, a heritage center near Chanpatna, an industrial center near Ramnagaram, a corporate center near Bidadi, and a commercial center near Bangalore. What creative imagination binds these five different townships and heralds a new urban order? In the deliberately platitudinous vision that is spelt out, one may detect nothing but a certain kind of bankruptcy. It says, this is the, what the plan tells us. Each of the townships has been proposed on a unique economic basis which will provide employment opportunities to the people in the region as well as prevent out-migration. It will also decongest the city by encouraging the population in the city to move out to the townships. Um, so it says, for instance, that the communities in these townships share a common planning philosophy. The town must be modern, but accommodate traditional Karnataka lifestyles, customs, and cultural values. Transportation, access, and utility infrastructure will be provided to a greater, uh, um, uh, provided so that the ultimate devel development capacity will be then initially needed for these areas will be created by the consortium. Each township has a primary town center with supporting neighborhood centers. And, and it is emphasizing, of course, the fact that you can walk to uh, your school, to work, to shopping, etc. Nothing is going to be more than half a mile away from your residence. The result is a unique com communities that are built on the strong foundation of proven town planning principles. Now, what uh, we are seeing here is... Um, a very interesting paradox, because we are seeing here the, uh, uh, an emphasis on the human scale, and let me just quickly point out that these visions of these sort of neighborhoods are taken from certain kinds of American uh, developments of the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, referred to as new urbanism, which deliberately tries to undermine the extraordinary dependence on the automobile that has been engendered in, in uh, suburban life in the United States. So it is precisely from the new urbanism that there is an encouragement for non-motorized forms of transport and uh, uh, a movement away from absolute dependent on automobilization. Recklessly borrowing from the romantic language of new urbanization, new urbanism in the 1990s of America, which was a powerful critique of an answer to the automobil automobilization of America, the consortium's vision runs into an inevitable paradox. On the one hand, it offers a plenitude of a kind, a bu bucolic rural, uh, a boutique rural, wrested from active farming communities, and on the other, it makes a commitment to the automobilized pleasures of the metropolis via the tolled expressway. Bangalore and Mysore, the twin cities whose salvation is tied to the corridor, present a unique rela relationship. As a city with little or no monumental heritage, despite its long past and uh, a very stilted public culture, Bangalore's identity rests quite heavily on its economic profile, though at least two previous stages of industrialization have been wiped out. And we've seen this in the maps that I've tried to show you. As many as 35,000 IT professionals now I'm showing you the, uh, uh, the road as it is under construction. As many as 35,000 IT professionals signed the petition demanding the completion of the peripheral road by NICE, which eased their passage between home and work, effectively treating the city and particularly its old core as one which is to be bypassed, to move through, uh, not to be in. Mysore, on the other hand, basks in the glow of its museumized city space 
which throughout the 19th, uh, 20th century has been a specifically tourist destination. Is the corridor development envisaged as something which will protect, protect these two prof profiles for posterity? I think the answers are not very clear, at least in the kind of theme park developments that these townships seem to be wanting to develop. I want to uh, end this presentation, if uh, Vrinda will permit me another minute, to uh, 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 talk about the form of urbanism by which, uh, which by reasons of being excluded is leading to a new vision. So is there, clearly what I'm pointing out to you is that there is no vision of a new urbanism that is coming through in the kind of plans that have been made by the NICE consortium. So the question will be, then to ask whether there is a, a new kind of urbanism that is being imagined from below, as it were, by those who are in some ways protesting the uh, acquisition of their lands. Because, and I'm saying urbanism precisely because, and this is the point which I want to make before concluding, that the transactions on these lands that, which lie between Bangalore and Mysore, particularly in the, uh, in the lands around Bangalore and Mysore, have already been vigorously taken up by the owners of land themselves. So it's not like we are not talking about a situation where there are some kind of pure victims vis-a-vis -vis some uh, you know, rubber barons. As, uh, I mean, certainly there is something problematic about Ashok Kenny and his company, but I'm trying to suggest that all kinds of negotiations have been happening over this 20-year period which muddy the ground, which do not allow us or permit us to actually put the people whose lands are being acquired into the status of being pure victims. And I say this because uh, in an interview which was taken by uh, Atul Kulkarni, who has studied the acquisition of a tank in particular in this area, the farmers told him, and I just quote this, after 2010 onwards, several farmers protested and put cases in court against NICE. Then government set up a fast track court to deal with several cases related to acquisition of land under NICE. The price of the land was fixed by NICE at 4 lakhs per acre, but several landlords protested and negotiated to 10 lakhs per acre with a 60-40 site and settled finally for 7 lakhs per acre with one site. We landlords have no choice but to sell off the land. And what you see here is uh, 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 an active negotiation over the uh, compensation that is being offered by the wealthier farmers in particular, while the poorer farmers have been left relatively unrecognized in this uh, region. Clearly some farmers, as several other recent works have shown, are actively and profitably engaging with this market in land, rather than being the gullible victims, as the petitions may suggest. Nevertheless, much of the opposition to the project, and this is true even of the Dalit Sangar Samiti, and maybe this can come up in the question answer period, what the in the EPW, we had a very interesting article which talked about a new form of urbanization from below where the number of census towns is actually accounting for a much higher degree of urbanization than statutory, statutory towns. So clearly something is happening which is transforming relations from below itself, of which this uh, project is perhaps a very visible, uh, you know, large part. Um, so and, and we have, as some of you perhaps know, in the 12th plan, a commitment by the government to the development of what is called smart cities and uh, 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 a commitment in the BJP manifesto in particular to set up 100 uh, smart cities which will not go through the painful torture of waiting for 30 years in order to build up its urbanization will be something which will be set up just like that. Um, so what am I saying here by way of conclusion? I'm suggesting that there was, there was, a, there was an interesting, um, there is an interesting saying uh, which translates roughly as you go to the city when you are ruined, uh, uh, Kannada saying. And that was the reason which was cited by census uh, commissioners in the early part of the 20th century to explain the rather weak development of urbanization right up until the 1930s. What we're seeing now is perhaps a, uh, the ruins of the city itself arriving at the doorsteps of, those, uh, of these villages, which are themselves hemorrhaging in a variety of ways, only part of which is explained by the establishment of this infrastructure corridor project. Unlike 
the old city forms which we have seen right at the beginning in the maps of the uh, which which had very clearly developed walls and citadels these are the features of the uh, old cities uh, all of which are now obsolescent they are no longer the signs of city uh, 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 how you know if there's a wall you breach the wall if there is a citadel you storm the citadel but what do you do when the kinds of forces that are arranged against you are so amorphous so difficult in some ways to pin down identify and and combat except through the very very tortuous uh, process of the law thank you very much